Hello and welcome to Access Chat. We've got two guests for the price of one today. I'm delighted to welcome Vernon Sankey and Katie Lockwood to, to the show. Um, they are co-authors of the book, The Way, Finding Peace in Turbulent Times. Uh, I came across Vernon because he's actually engaged with, with some of my, my day job work um, and is uh, an independent director at, at the company that Antonia and I work for, Atos. Um, but that's not why Vernon's here today. So Vernon, you, please tell us a little bit more about yourself because you've had a background in business leadership. You've been a you know, CEO of FMCG companies and big ones. But the work that you do now um, and the work that you're doing through the way and business mentoring is, is very different. And, and I, I think that our audience will really love the, the work that, that you and Katie are doing. So please tell us about it. All right, well, I, I'm very happy to start, but then we'll, we'll listen to Katie's story because, in fact, um, a lot of the, the work that I'm now doing on things like the way has been stimulated by Katie's interventions. Um, so we forget the business career. I mean, it, it was a long business career, and I still have it um, with Atos, which I thoroughly enjoy. It's a great, great pleasure to work in that company, um, and particularly with all the developments taking place which include all the things that you're doing. Um, I'm on the, the Corporate Social Responsibility Committee, which was only formed 18 months, two years ago, and I have been stunned by the progress that's been made, quite rightly. So things that appear to be completely odd in the company, you know, how could you possibly talk about things like purpose, suddenly become really real and have really exceeded all expectations and they're going full out, which is exactly where, where corporations should go. I think corporations can set, set the lead for a world change. Um, and so I, I did set up a coaching company with a colleague in the early 2000s based on um, coaching and mentoring senior executives predominantly, but it also included sports personalities, members of parliament, even members of royal families and so on, in order to help them and guide them through what became obvious were difficult times that they were going through. And there was a tremendous commonality of that. So the company developed, and I then learned a lot of cognitive psychology and applied that. And then later on, when I happened to meet Katie, I was writing a book called The Stairway to Happiness, which is also available. And Katie kept saying, well, you haven't really completed it, even though I thought this was a masterpiece. Right? And, um, and I kept saying, well, why is that? And she said, well, because it, it really doesn't go far enough. And I thought, well, why doesn't it go far enough? Um, and that brought me into the whole area of what some people call spirituality, but it's actually going beyond the self. It's going beyond what people think is everyday and normal. Um, and it takes you to a different place. And as I, and I, I finally started to get it, and the last chapter of the stairway is the beginnings of this discovery. Um, and then we decided that really there was so much in that last chapter that was unfinished that we should really write a book up, which takes it further. So the way finding peace in turbulent times takes this much further. And um, so it changes the way you see the world completely. It changes life. It's based on a blend, I suppose, of Hinduism, Buddhism, Zen Buddhism, various religions. And then there's a thing called the, 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 the perennial belief, which is across all religions. And then you suddenly find these people, although they may have lived in slightly different periods, are all saying the same thing. If you get be below the dogma and the catechisms, if you go below that, you find actually they're talking about human beings and how human beings relate to each other, how they relate to an infinite power, you may call it what you want, and that you are all connected to this infinite power. And if we're all connected to this infinite power, why, why would we want to harm each other? Because we are each other. We are actually related to each other. And we need to develop different kinds of skills, kindness, 
compassion, acceptance, belief, you know, love. In the end, it comes back to love. And if people have compassion for other people, if they are grateful for what they have, if they can see everything with some amazement with the eyes of a child, then all of a sudden, all these horrible things no longer, they don't matter anymore. They don't matter. The things that really matter are, what is the human being? What are you really at the deeper sense? And when you find that place and you take your decisions from that place, you don't have to worry about anything else. You don't need rules. You don't need regulations. You don't need dogma. You don't need catechisms. Just be yourself. And you will find you will take the best decisions. And they may not please everybody. Who cares? They're right. If they're right, they're right. And people may not like them. That's their problem. So that's really, the, in, some, in a nutshell, that is the message of the way, but we go through it systematically, explaining all these elements, explaining what it means to live in the present, to be who you are, to learn about your ego, to observe your ego, to go into meditation. So it goes through quite a lot of guidance as to how do you arrive at this place of inner peace, even in deeply turbulent times. And of course, this book was written, I don't know, a year and a half ago. Um, on page four, we talk about a pandemic. But that was ages. But it could have been anything. There are so many risks that human beings have created. It could have been any of them. Right? But the solution is the same. So that's, I'm sorry, it's, you will need to cut out most of this because I've gone far too long. But he can do that. No, it's oh. beautiful. No, like no. We were not going to cut a word out. <laughs> we like it. Yeah. Well, yeah. I hope you do. And now I'll pass over to Katie because her take on this is different from mine, right? Which is one of the beauties that we have, but it's equally more so, more spiritual than mine. <laughs> Go on, Katie. Um, my background is in spirituality, but it's philosophy, NLP, psychology, emotional intelligence. Um, and it is all about purpose and living more of a meaningful life kind of answering some of those deep questions that we're so often too busy to think about. We kind of got into that routine or into that sort of robotic mindset that we completely don't ask, you know, why we're here, what's the meaning of life, you know, those questions that are really good just to ascertain where we are in the world and what our purpose is. So when I met Vernon, yeah, he was writing the first book and I sort of wanted to bring my knowledge into the harmony aspect of of um, kind of the deeper thought of philosophy and that aspect of it and we wrote the second book which yeah I had a um, I had a, a little bit of an intuition of these times coming up and um, felt that I wanted to add something to help people and um, really to, instead of what, what I feel is happening currently is a lot of divide is happening and, and that was a concern to me because I do feel that we are all interconnected and we're all part of the same soul of the human, the human being and therefore we all are part of this together and, and as soon as we divide we lose the power of, of us collectively um, so yes, I mean, it's about personal consciousness, but it is about the collective consciousness because if we don't change this now, it's going to be, it's how we evolve as humanity. You know, in history, lots of things have happened, but if we don't change our thinking around it, as Einstein said, we create the same solution. So what we need to do is to change our thinking and hopefully come up with a more, a better solution, which provides um, peace and prosperity for the all of the human race so yes yeah I, Katie and Vernon uh, I'm so glad you're on the program today I know I needed it I needed this conversation and I'm a I'm a big longtime spiritual seeker I've been even as a child I was born in <clears throat> I was born into a very emotionally traumatized family and long stories made me stronger so it was a blessing but I remember even as a child I I didn't understand some of the dogma that was being thrown at me for example my parents would 
take us, I wanted to go to church. And so my parents would take me to church and drop me off at the church. I would you know, do my thing. And I remember, <clears throat> and it was a Baptist church. I'm from Florida. And the Southern Baptists are very common in the southern part, east southern part of the United States, especially. And I remember being told in Sunday school one day that um, if you didn't go to church, you were going to hell. And I was able, even as a small child, to say, well, wait a minute, that means my parents, I'm going to go to hell with my parents. I want to be with my parents. And so I remember being confused by the dogma at the time. And I actually stopped going to church for a while after that because... I didn't want, there were other times I was happy for my parents to go one place, I'll go the other. Both of my parents have gone to the other side now, but I've been doing spiritual work forever. And so really, really glad to know about your book and, um, and all of your books, and I'm going to go and do it. But during this time of COVID-19 and the pandemic, I do believe that there's some real beauty that's happening during this time. We are really busy fighting and fussing with each other. And, and I think that in the United States, just from my lens for a moment, you know, we're so interested in capitalism, but I think we should be thinking about conscious capitalism. And Vernon, you mentioned being on the board, you know, work, well, being, working with ATOS and that they're going to be purpose-driven and corporate social responsibility. And I believe in all that, but I think often corporations are still playing with us a little bit more. Yeah. I, I'd like this to be a little bit more real, but I believe after what we're all walking right now, I do believe yeah. that what's happening is we're actually being, um, we, we are growing. Mother Earth is saying grow, 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 expand. Yeah. So I was just curious. I've read many times that every time we have to make a choice, we can make a choice, one or two choices. I'm curious what y'all think of this. And it can either be a choice from love or it can be a choice from negativity or fear. I'm, I'm not even sure if you can have a neutral choice. I think of the, with the big decisions, you have one or the other, and we often talk about include. We talk about inclusion of people with disabilities, and that people aren't broken because they're gay. They, they have dyslexia. They have curly hair, like Antonio. People aren't broken with whatever label you want to put on them. So, is this an opportunity for humanity to really evolve and really come together and accept mm -hmm. that all lives matter? Black lives matter. People with disabilities matter. Women matter. People with curly hair, you know, so let me hush. Absolutely, that. absolutely. I'm going to let Katie answer. It's, it's absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Go on, Katie. No, no, I, I completely, totally agree with you. I don't really agree with the whole labeling thing. I think as soon as we label something, we've just disempowered it. It's not about you're white, I'm black, you're pink, you're blue. I've got, I mean, it's just insane, isn't it? So as soon as we differentiate between that and therefore we thinking in a higher consciousness to just say well actually I'm part of you and you are part of me and we have a different conversation then so it's not like I have to think I'm better than you or you're not best it's just a, it's just a great conversation of I've got your back you've got my back and if you imagine if business was done with conscience as well and you know and we're living that way I mean the world just would completely change conscious capitalism Conscious yeah. capitalism. Can, can I can I add add a couple of things? Um, one is one is on the philosophy, the perennial philosophy really, and the other is on the business, the business side. So we're going to go from a very philosophical point of view and then into a very practical point of view. Right? The philosophical point of view is that is that we all have what's called a Buddha nature, or it's who our true nature is. What our true nature is. What is that? It's the nature that we have before the conditioning. So what you were talking about, the Baptist church, but it could be any, is conditioning. But that conditioning is all man-made, and most of it has various reasons for it. Right? So underneath it all, it's actually a very found, sound message. But even in Buddhism, the doctrinal Buddhist makes all kinds of errors. Why? Because they're trying to control something trying to put a spin on something that doesn't warrant it at all. Our Buddha nature is our natural being, and our natural being is compassionate, is kind. Look at a child with, a, with an animal. I've just put a post on today of this beautiful child holding a, holding a, a, a dog, and it reminded me that somebody said to me, well, what is in a piece? 
And I've said, there's nothing to it. There's no thing to it. It just is. Just be. Just be like this child. That's inner peace. The child has done one thing, which is to love this pet. Nothing else matters, right? And that's our nature. However, as we grow up, we get pushed into a system which conditions us. We've got to do this, we've got to do that. And we end up on a rat race, we've, which we're not even aware until we get to a certain age and we turn around and say, well, hold on, where's all this going to? And, and, and I don't feel any different. In fact, I feel there's still something missing. Of course, what you've done is you've rejected it by going down a path conditioning, which is the ego. Right now, now that's the first of now. Looking at the always oh, a lovely little child has come in. Hiya. Hey Beatrice. <laughs> so now we go to business, and the great opportunity with COVID, the great opportunity is that it has forced people to completely rethink what they're doing. All of a sudden, they're saying, "Do you know? I like my garden." Do you know, I like nature. Do you know, I like the fact that I don't have all this noise pollution. I like the fact that um, there are fish back in the, in, the, in the rivers. I like the fact that we're questioning things again. I like the peace and quiet. I like to be able to think. I like to have to avoid to do commuting. I don't want the cars. I don't want the smells. I don't want all this. And it's giving an opportunity to change. What is, I think, really encouraging is that businesses are beginning to realize now, and I agree there's still a lot of tick box, a lot of people doing things because it's, it's again conditioned to do it, right? They don't believe it. But if they really believe it, what they're finding is that the actions they're taking, which appear to be altruistic and are altruistic, are actually very good business. They're very good business. In other words, if you, if you want customers who understand what's going on, to follow you and to be part of who you are and you deliver something which is clearly good you're going to make good business it's going to be good business so one of the things we've done and neil will know this we've done an awful lot of work on reducing the carbon the carbon content of all our, our business and an it company generates huge amounts of co2 because of all the servers but we've reduced that carbon by over 50 percent already and we've just made an announcement saying we're going to, we're going to ad adhere to a 1.5%, which is a Paris Agreement, but actually we're going to do better than that. We're going to get to zero. And then we say, but hold on, if we can do that, maybe we can help other people do that. Oh yeah, everybody needs to do that. That's a fantastic business opportunity. If we look at what Neil's doing with the inclusion all the things we're able to do to help people with so-called disabilities, right? So-called, what the heck's a disability? Everybody has a disability. Some are more visible than others, right? But we all have an issue. And if we think we haven't, then we, we're saying that we're perfect. And I, all I can tell you is perfection is horrible. Right? We, I don't want anybody perfect. I want people imperfect. Why? Because that's part of the creativity of life. Right? And these people are brilliant. And so, if you, and then if you see what Neil's doing, that's creating systems to enable people to have really good workplaces, really good environments, and, and that's saleable too. Everybody should be doing that. So I actually have great hope and enthusiasm that we've got two big tendencies. You've got a, a sort of reactive tendency that's going to try and hold this up because they don't like it. It's going to break a lot of things that people are used to, and they don't like it, and particularly the status quo. You know, this is, this, is, this is threatening in many respects. But on the other hand, for I think the vast majority of decent people, they will say, this is where we've got to go. And that is the way forward. And if we could, that's, that's what we mean by raising the level of consciousness. If we can raise the level of consciousness, we have a different world. You know, it would only take a reduction of 8% of a world spend on, on, on weapons, only 8% reduction, and there'd be no hunger, 8%, that's all, 8%, right? And we have so many weapons, we can blow each other up a million times already. Why do we need all this stuff? Can we put you in as president of the US, please? <laughs> We're, we, we have something coming up in November, Vernon. <laughs> <laughs> no, I would be terrible at it. <laughs> anyway, I, you know, this is, this is really in response to the, the, the questions you were, you were raising, Demo.
so I've, 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 I've got a follow on from that. And, 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 and some of this is business related as well. So um, people like myself are, are, are focused on roles in looking to do public good. But at the same time, um, we're, we're, we're kind of um, in a silo or, or have been. I think that there are moves to, to become more general. But, but do we, in order to, to, to gain that uh, real momentum, actually need to take on more generalist roles? Because what I'm, what I'm trying to sort of comprehend at the moment is whether I need to try and push what I'm doing into the mainstream or, or take them or, or actually go into the mainstream and bringing in inclusion from the other side. Because sometimes I think that, that when you're in a specialist role, it, it, it stays niche. So it, I'm, I'm really thinking about how can we mainstream inclusion in business. And I know that I agree with you totally uh, about business having the power to change the world. Uh, and, and, and our good friend Caroline Casey, who runs the Valuable 500, is you know, 100% behind this because she's gone and found hundreds of business leaders to commit to inclusion too. So we're all of one mind, but it's now, it's more a question of the mechanics. Do we do it from a specialism or, or, or actually um, does it require us to take on more generalist leadership roles and do the things that maybe we don't like doing, like the accounts and uh, the, the, the mechanics of general business because it's a necessary uh, means to an end to building a better world. Well, I mean, you know, I'd have to think about that because it's a complex question. But my, my instinct, my instant reaction would be, what you're doing, you may call a specialism, but it's actually incredibly important. And you have a great understanding of it. And you have assembled colleagues who have great understanding of it. And you're making enormous changes from that. So, and it's, you know, you may be, you may be thinking, oh my goodness, you know, should I do, should I go into a, a wider thing? From my point of view, it's relatively new what you're doing. And it's got an enormous, um, it's got huge legs to, to run on. There's an enormous amount still to do. And I think the way you're doing it by trying to bring as many people in as possible. And I think the thing is to get the corporations to really embrace it, not just in words, or in fact, not even in words. I'd rather they didn't have the words, but did it. See what I mean? And we may need to change some of the terminology because, you know, disability may not be the right word. I don't bother me because I think everybody's got disability, as I said, but we may have to find different words. It is about inclusion. It's about every person having an opportunity to contribute. And, and, uh, and the role of corporate, the role of the world is actually to help them to be able to do that. And quite frankly, in some, I was reading some other thing which was to do with, um, with um, uh, autistic people. And I thought I'd, I'll, I'll tell you what it says. In general, businesses are still very laser focused on social skills when it comes to employees. This needs to change. Instead of training autistic people to behave like non-autistic people, we should be working to change the labor market to make it more inclusive and adaptive for the benefit of all. We want businesses to understand that given the right support, a neurodiverse adult could not just hold down a job but be the best person for it. And this is particularly true of autistic people yeah. because the autistic people are absolutely brilliant. And yeah. if you actually handle them right and give them the right opportunities, whoa, you know, you've got talent there that has great value. So to come back to your question, I personally would say stick with what you're doing. You don't need to broaden it because there's an awful lot still to do. Oh, I'm under no illusion that we've got a, a, a road yet to travel, for sure. Katie, did you want to come in? I had muted you to, for the sound. That yeah. should be fine now. Um, no, I was, I was, the thing I was going to say is um, my daughter goes to school and she is probably class, classed as dyslexic. But again, because we have this education system, which is extremely left-brained, the artistic um, 
children are obvious are, are being labeled again and, and it's almost like they've got a disability whereas she doesn't have a disability she just can't um relate to the same information in the same way but it's it's very difficult because the school system is so regimented in that box ticking system that if they don't fit in that system it's like well what can we what can i do now and actually her strengths are other things but because the school doesn't understand that aspect it's it's yeah it's, it's quite it's it's difficult and i don't think it should be i think it should be much more inclusive uh, so we're talking to one dyslexic adhd here uh, and deborah's adhd um most people are so um most people are most yeah, people are. Yeah. how about it how about if our schools would teach our children the way their brains work Sorry exactly <laughs> so, so absolutely we need to change the way that we teach people and address people but your daughter will be fine and she will actually thrive once she through the pain of the school system um I know from my own experience that school wasn't the best thing for me um, and I had to find my way um, to, and find what I, I was good at in order to be comfortable and comfortable. I'm sorry I muted you again I'm just getting this echo and it's driving me a bit crazy um, but 100% agree we need to do better on this and embracing people's talent is a really key thing for us to do because it's it's the neurodivergent individuals that, that come up with these ideas that we need right now to be able to think differently to be able to to address the challenges that we're being presented with because people who are dyslexic people who are autistic people who are adhd think differently and it's our entrenched ways of thinking the, the the conditioning that yourself and vernon have talked about that are part of the problem that has got us to the place obviously covid is a separate issue but we we've arrived at a point in society where we were ready for change anyway it's been accelerated by the pandemic crisis i think that's um and and i will introduce you to some people afterwards that I think you'll love um, around dyslexia and neurodiversity. So we'll do that one offline, but it's a big part. You, you know, you know, you've heard of Darcy Bustle, the uh, yes, famous yes. Uh, ballerina. She's dyslexic. Yes. She, she, she hated school. She couldn't finish it, but, her, but uh, look what's happened to her. She became, you know, one of the, the best prima donnas, I mean, prima ballerinas, sorry, prima ballerinas. She does television work. She's a wonderful, wonderful woman. There's, uh, there's absolutely nothing wrong. In fact, it, it's, better to have, it's better to have something that you know you need to work on than to go away or go around thinking that you don't. Yeah. So, and, you know, what, I, what we do in coaching, what I'm finding in coaching and psychology all the time, is that the things that people call weaknesses are actually overplayed strengths. Right. So, you know, so if I get very passionate as I do and I overdo it, it becomes a weakness because you lose your audience. Right. <laughs> you see what I mean? So yeah. uh, it, it, and I think we, we all we all have so much to learn, but we all have to accept the fact we're all different. And that's the beauty of life. It's different. Life is impermanent. Life is never the same. You know, no, no man steps in the same river twice. It's not the same man and it's not the same river. So we're constantly changing. The problem is we get very stressed because we're trying to control everything. We're trying to determine everything. It can't be done. It can't be done. It's constantly shifting. And COVID has really brought this out. You know, we had all these plans and everybody always, planned. and people are very, very stressed now because what do I do? I'm trying to control an environment that I can't control. No, you're not meant to. But what you do is you embrace it. So, so I was going to say, have to let go, but you're saying embrace. So yeah, but the thing is, you know, if if you could predict everything that's going to happen, every single thing that's going to happen to you in the next fifteen years, if you could predict that, how do you feel? Actually, not that good. 
nut. And you, I would be bored, bored. you would get bored to tears very, very quickly. If you knew exactly what, was, what you were going to eat in three days' time, where you were going to be, who you were going to see, the mystery and magic of life is its impermanence. So now we come back to another philosophical point, which is in, in Buddhist philosophy, life is suffering, and suffering means it, it's attachment. If you're attached to something, you're attached to the outcome of something, you're attached to what you think is going to happen, that is suffering. If you want to end suffering, you remove that attachment, which means you start to accept that life is impermanent, and then you realize that that's what makes the beauty of life. You don't know what's going to happen, and it's constantly challenging you. That is magnificent. That is what makes it great. So while everybody in the West is saying, oh my God, not another chaos, not another thing, what am I going to do? If you've got the right attitude, you say, how fantastic, what opportunities we've now got to make differences, to make change. It happens so rarely, let's make the most of it. Do you see the difference in philosophical attitude? Completely, one is very negative, very, very saying, I've got to control, I've got to control. But so the other says, why? Who wants to control? The beauty is actually in, in, is in the insecurity, and I know it sounds terribly paradoxical and terribly odd, but I would rather be insecure and enjoy that insecurity because I can do something about it than be totally secure, in which case I might as well not be around. Well said. Well, they're very difficult paradoxes because these are not, these are counterintuitive. They're the exact opposite of what we're taught. Yes. Um, so, I know a little bit about Buddhism and I know about Siddhartha's journey and his, his you know, leaving his family behind and the, 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 the difficulty he had sort of seeing decay and death around him and, and, and all of that. So, um, and it is definitely a, a very different perspective to, to the West where we are you know, pursuing immortality. We're spending tech billions uh, on, on trying to be immortal, trying to upload our, uh, our brains and chasing the singularity. So, um, but see, his, his awakening, because his, he spent 40, 40 days really completely on his own with no, very little food or drink, trying to follow the Hindu doctrine. And his awakening came when he realized he was actually wasting his time. To try and follow dogma wasn't working. So being either an ascetic, which is, you know, on my own, no food, no drink, so is this the way forward? No. Right. Hedonism, he'd given up because he'd seen what happened when he was, he was, he was the son of a, of a prince who owned vast fortunes. Right? That doesn't work. And the other doesn't work either. So if I'm trying to be more religious and holier than thou, that doesn't work. And if I try and be too hedonistic, that doesn't work. Hence the middle way, just be myself. The awakening is, I don't need ego. I don't need conditioning, I'm just myself. Uh, That's the awakening. But we don't get to that, we find very hard. It's very simple really. But we cause for conditioning and our ego keeps saying, well, no, no, you've got to do this and you've got to get that. And how can you let this happen? And you're in competition with this and whoa, whoa. That's just a source of suffering. You're not accepting what is accepted. If I'm not in conflict with what's happening, like how can there be any stress? So, oh, Vern, today yes. we have uh, many ideas that are, are passing uh, within, uh, within society that uh, are somehow done in a way that force people to think that, oh, uh, I need to be that person, I need to be that individual, I need my son or my daughter to study this or that, you know, there's a huge concept about, oh, everyone needs to learn how to code, Every, everyone needs to be an engineer. How, how do we move away from this, knowing this is a very, uh, this is actually at the, on the early days of sociology, this was something that was always being very questioned, but we lost it a little bit. How do we, how do we move away from this? Yeah, well, it's a very good question. And the whole of the education system, starting from day one, is about succeeding with exams, 
filling yourself with facts and figures, filling yourself with, with data, filling yourself with techniques for doing this, for doing that, for doing the other. And we've lost all of humanity. We've also lost a lot of creativity. We've lost humanity. As, as Katie was saying about her daughter, her daughter is very, very creative. Fantastic at shows, dancing, singing, right? Do we value that in the same way as we value somebody who's passed the maths exam? Right? No, I say, but actually I know which I'd rather be with. I know what I'd rather value. I know what will in the end create more value to the world. So what we need to do, I mean, and this is, you know, one of the big issues we have is how are we going to create jobs in the future? And we, this has been happening all the way through. So we had the industrial revolution where people went from an agrarian one to actually a factory thinking they would improve their, their life by being able to you know, run, run machines. Now, of course, we're going to get robots. And you're going to need, there's going to be a, a group of people who clearly are going to need to be technically very, very conversant with that. That doesn't mean to say that anybody who isn't can't contribute massively. Because the fact is, all the other things are going to need to be helped much more than they are now. And the service industries that actually help people, you know, we are very short of, of medical people, who medical, not necessarily just doctors, but people who look after others. Our, our care homes are not well enough looked after because it's not viewed as a valuable piece of work. There's care which is going to be required around, around the world. Ch children need to be helped through all of these things. You know, there are many other jobs than just going through the exam process. And the exam process, I mean, how much of, how much of what I learned at university do I actually use? The, the answer is very, very little. The things I really use were the lectures that I wasn't supposed to go to, which were much more interesting than the ones I did. There were conversations with my tutors that were outside the scope of the university. That's where I, that's where I learned something. The other was, okay, fine. I, I think it's really, the trouble is we have to start right from the beginning. We have to start with the education at a much younger age. We have to help people to understand what really matters, who they are, the fact that we are part of something much greater. You're, you do not stop at the skin. The skin is simply your contact with the rest of the world. We cannot exist without the outside. We can't exist. We think we can, but we can't. It doesn't so we're, do it, possible. So maybe we're spiritual beings having a human experience, uh, right. right? And absolutely, right, Katie. Katie, I don't know if you want to, you know, weigh in. Yeah, here, but, um, well, I, I, you two must have been amazing writing Katie. these books together. Yeah. And Katie right. is still muted, uh, but I, I, y'all must have. It's really what it, what an interesting um, bringing your two spirits together to, uh, you know help change the world during a really difficult time. That's, it's really beautiful. So can you unmute Katie? I mean, did some, yeah. I don't know if Katie's muted or. Uh, yeah, we're having fun and games trying to un, unmute. When I, when I press the button, it doesn't do it. I, there we go, it's working now. Oh, there we go. All right, cool. Oh, no. All right. Oh, good. I was hoping that wasn't Katie that fell. I, good, good, good. That would be bad. I'm still here. Good. Um, no, definitely agree with spiritual beings on a human on a human journey, um, which I, most people I think completely don't get, um, and we just don't get connected to the spiritual side of ourselves. And I think that lack of connection actually is. I would say uh, the problem with a lot of society is they don't understand that connection, the soul connection, and everything is very mind connected and um, or technology, which is disconnecting ourselves um, from nature. So there has to be a balance, doesn't there, with these things? So if if the uh, if it goes too much on that side, then we're we've lost our essence of self which um yeah which which you can see obviously with with what's happening now and how we deal with things we don't know how to deal with it so you can see that if people don't know who they are then it's very reactive it's you know we're consuming so much negativity from the media and just as you said it's so confusing and there's so much fear and so much control there's so much um 
inconsistency and, and non-transparency that we don't know what is true and what's not, which is very conflicting for ourselves. So, yeah, I think there's, there's so much to be learned and, and I think it's really time that this knowledge becomes accessible to people. No, because the, the impact uh, in, in our mental health are, are really significant uh, uh, in, in the way how we uh, react and in the way how, how we uh, look at the expectations in relation to what, you know, what our employers want from us, what others want from us. Uh, and, and I think it's, it's important that we're able to uh, build some re resilience in order to be able to, to move and, and, and somehow help us to navigate in, in this world. Uh, because if you are not able to build that resilience by ourselves, no, we, we would be in, in a creating, a, sometimes probably find ref, re, refuge in things that might not be the healthiest and that will impact uh, the things around us. You know, I think that's something that we need to dive deep into more. Yeah, you, well, you, you're absolutely right. And that is the theme of our, of our book, actually, because, you know, everybody has exactly the same value doesn't matter who they are you know we are all the same and you are me and I am you so when I look at you I'm actually looking at myself when I make criticisms of somebody I'm actually making criticisms of myself right? we are actually so so deeply connected but that is not that is counterintuitive most people say no no we're completely different say well all right you know if you want to know what 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 um, how important things are just Spend a spend a, a night in a small room with, with a mosquito. You'll soon know how interdependent we are, right? You know, and you look outside, you see, you know, you don't see a flower without a bee, and you don't see a bee without a flower. They're two different things, but they're totally interdependent. They cannot survive without each other. We've lost all that. So what we're trying to do, we're constantly trying desperately to get more things but it's all about things today and in many respects many of the problems associated with COVID-19 is we're trying to resolve it through looking at the outside and solving outside things just in 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 everyday life they say always oh, we've got an economic problem we'll have to solve it by fixing the outside that's like trying to fix the deck chairs on the Titanic we're looking in the wrong place and governments have been doing this all the time and so we're creating bigger and bigger monsters. If we don't stop that process, there is an inevitability about it. And that is what the scientists are all saying. Um, there was there's a scientist who, was, um, who I know quite well, who was the master of uh, Trinity Cambridge, who's written a very good book. And, and he, he was saying all that. And I said, D did you, are you there for what? Are you optimistic or pessimistic about future? And he said, I'm very pessimistic about the future because the way we are going is going literally lemming-like over a cliff. So we have to stop that. And the only way we'll stop that is by changing the mindset. We have to move to a different mindset. And that mindset is in many respects going back to who we really are. And then we can stop all this nonsense because it's nonsense. I mean, how can you be creating the sort of problems that we're creating? How can you be building the sort of weaponry that we're building? And, and we're trying to control our environment. Why? The environment is doing fine on its own, right? We're destroying it. We're destroying the rainforest. We're trying, we're, do, we're, doing, we're doing all this damage. Why? Out of greed. And if we have polluted oceans, it's because we like disposable stuff. We all like disposable stuff. And so we chuck it. Do you know, there was this, yesterday, there was a beach in, called um, Bournemouth in England. There were half a million people descended on this beach, right? And they left, 40 tons of rubbish 40 yeah. tons of rubbish and 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 probably a load of infected people too on, on like loads, of, loads of infected people so so um we've reached the end of our time i know we could go on for a lot longer so i would just like to thank you both and katie it's been a, a great discussion i'm really looking forward to how people are going to engage on this on twitter on on, on tuesday night need to thank Barclays Access, Microlink and MyClearText for 
keeping the lights on and keeping us captioned and accessible. Um, thank you once again. Really look forward to, to you joining us on Twitter. It's been a great conversation. Thank you. Well, thank you for your questions and we're delighted to be here. Katie. We really do want to talk for another four hours if you don't mind. <laughs> Especially me. Well, I, just, States, I, just, but... I just want to say that none of this would be possible unless Katie actually mentioned all these things to me in the first place. It, it, put well, me on a, it, put, it put me on a new journey. And, and I'm so glad that we're recognizing it. And I just want to say that, um, and then I'll get off air. Katie, she's so, and I'm going to talk about Katie. She's so beautiful that it's interesting because we also label people that, especially women that are beautiful. We, we decide that women as beautiful as Katie, they must not be smart. That's another label. It's so interesting how we label people. So uh, I think it's really powerful that Katie as a mother, as a spiritual leader, is really continuing to show us all the way. Very interesting to see what our youth are teaching us right now, watching what happened with the TikTok and the K-pop, where with, say, a president of one country's, you know, rally, but also attacking the racist tags. So there's something happening here that's powerful. And I think the work you two are doing are going to help us all lead us out of this so that 